Hello and welcome everyone to today's CID speaker series. My name is Sarah Luttrell. I'm the Communications and Events Manager at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. I look forward to today's discussion on strategies to change the trajectory and narrative surrounding poverty. Uh, the format for today's session is around a 20 to 25 minute presentation, leaving around 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, before we get started though, I do want to mention a few housekeeping items. So during the Q&A session, you can submit your questions directly to the chat um, and also by using the raise your hand function and you can ask your questions directly to the speaker. Um, CID student ambassador Sarah Dinorain will be moderating today's discussion. So she's here with us, which we're excited about. Um, we're also recording today's session and the video of this event will be available on CID's YouTube channel. I will also add links in the chat so you can sign up for CID's newsletter and to hear more about events like this and also to sign up for our social media channels. Um, our next speaker series is a panel event uh, that will take place on Friday, October 15th at 12.15 p.m. So just slightly later than our usual time of 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and this event will be with Andrew Stern, who is the founder and CEO of the Global Development Incubator. Um, and he'll be speaking on creating impact at a global scale for development. And this conversation will be moderated by Harvest, Harvard Business School senior lecturer, Brian Trellstad. So we hope that you'll join us for that event. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Diane Calvi. Diane is president and CEO of Village Enterprise, a nonprofit working in sub-Saharan Africa that aims to alleviate poverty through entrepreneurship and innovation. Since joining Village Enterprise in 2010, Diane has increased the breadth and depth of the organization's impact. To date, Village Enterprise has started over 58,000 businesses, trained over 214,000 new small business owners, and lifted 1.2 million people out of extreme poverty. So today we'll discuss this approach using entrepreneurship, innovation, and evidence to drive poverty alleviation. So thank you all for being here today, and Diane, over to you. Thanks, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, can everyone see my screen now? Okay, yes. Yeah. So as um, Sarah yeah. mentioned, I'm Diane Calvi, and I'm CEO of Village Enterprise. Um, Village Enterprise, as Sarah mentioned, is an NGO working in rural Africa that equips people living in extreme poverty with all the resources they need to start sustainable businesses and savings groups. And we believe that entrepreneurship innovation and evidence can drive poverty alleviation. And I'm here to speak to you today about these three elements. But before I do, I'd like to open with something even more fundamental. I'd like to introduce you to two extraordinary women that I have met during my field visits. Like many of the women I meet, they are both incredibly bright, hardworking and resourceful. And since they're both moms, I could really relate to them as I'm also a mom and we shared so many things in common. Yet they both had to overcome overwhelming obstacles that I've never had to face. Vicky on the left was just 12 years old when the Lord's Resistance Army stormed her small rural Ugandan village in the middle of the night and killed every member of her family. At a very young age, Vicky lost all hope for the future. Like Vicky, Salome was also a victim of conflict. A mother of seven children, she was forced to flee her home in South Sudan with her, with her children when war broke out. Because her husband went to fight, she doesn't know where her husband is or even if he's still alive. She had to walk for two months with her children carrying her one-year-old on her back, not knowing where their next meal would come from, not knowing where they would find water. I met Salome in the Bidi Bidi refugee camp in northern Uganda. She told me that when she arrived in the camp, she too had lost hope for her future and the future of her children. I believe that hope is a fundamental force in transforming our lives. Each and every one of us hopes for something each day. We can all relate to hope. Hope's part of the human condition. It's what keeps us going when we're in despair. Nobel Prize winner and MIT economics professor Esther Duflo asked the question, is there something fundamentally different about life under extreme poverty? What would it do to you to have no way out? What would it do to you be in an area with no money, very little food, no education, no medical care, 
and perhaps even an oppressive force that keeps you in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty extinguishes hope. Fortunately, there's growing support in the world to end extreme poverty. As you probably all know, the number one sustainable development goal of the United Nations is to end extreme poverty by 2030. My question to all of you is, do you think it's possible to end extreme poverty? When making projections for the future, it's always helpful to look at the past. And the data is quite encouraging. In the past 100 years, the share of people living in extreme poverty has dramatically dropped. In the early 1800s, most people, close to 85%, lived in extreme poverty. According to the World Bank, by 1990, the percentage had dropped to 36% and just under 2 billion people. That's still a lot of people. But what's even more encouraging is that for 25 years, we saw dramatic improvements and a steady decline, both in the percentage of people living in extreme poverty and the absolute number of people, which was remarkable given that the global population continued to climb. By 2010, less than 10% of the world's population or 730 million people lived in extreme poverty over half of them in Africa. If progress had continued as projected by the World Bank, by 2030, a little less than a half a billion people, most of them in Africa, would still be living in extreme poverty by 2030. But these projections were made in 2018 before the COVID pandemic. Earlier this year, the World Bank revised its projections and now estimates that an additional 97 million people will be added to the number of the extreme poor because of the pandemic. Even if global poverty continues to reduce at the pace we expected before the pandemic, every year there'll be tens of millions of people living in poverty because of the initial fallout from the pandemic. A number of recent studies has pointed to the fact that if no significant action is taken, the SDGs will not be met by a wide margin. The pandemic has made what was a very audacious goal appear unattainable. However, I would argue that with the right policy decisions, continued global support and sufficient funding, it's still possible to end extreme poverty. The first question is how much money would it take? According to Oxford economist, Max Roser at The World and Data, the answer is that we need around 160 billion international dollars per year to close the global poverty gap, according to 2013 figures, the latest for which we have good data. According to Roser, the equivalent figure in 2015 market dollars is about $90 billion, much less than the yearly military expenditures of the US. Just in 2020 alone, the United States spent $725 billion on national defense. Um, okay, sorry, <laughs> there is a problem with advancing my slide. But even more relevant comparison is that the global value of foreign aid dollars estimated by Chandy and others at around 150 billion market dollars for the same year. You could conclude that the elimination of extreme poverty could be poss possible by allocating aid more wisely. But most aid is used to build physical infrastructure and strengthen institutions, which is also important. So if we want to eliminate extreme poverty, we'll also need to introduce new evidence-based policies and strengthen social protection systems that will ensure money flows to the extreme poor. And this will require additional sources of funding, not just better allocation of existing aid dollars. We also know that money alone won't solve the problem of extreme poverty. In order to effectively lift people out of extreme poverty, we have to address the multiple poverty traps that keep them in poverty. Low levels of economic growth and opportunity, lack of infrastructure, education, knowledge, and know-how, 
problems of gender equity and climate change. There are three approaches that have been scaled up to address the problem of household poverty with the precise goal of increasing incomes of the world's poorest, microcredit, cash transfer, and poverty graduation programs. In the 2000s, these approaches have undergone rigorous evaluation using randomized control trials to generate evidence about the effectiveness of these approaches. One of the solutions to solving the problem of extreme poverty is using evidence to drive policy decisions and the allocation of funding. This approach has received wide acclaim, and in 2019, Michael Kramer, Abhijit Banerjee, and Esther Duflo were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty, one that has transformed development economics. Before Kramer, Banerjee, and Duflo, Mohammed Yunus was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, along with the Grameen Bank in 2006, for their contribution to create economic and social development from below. In the early 2000s, there was a lot of excitement over Yunus and Grameen Bank's approach to eradicating poverty through microlending. However, when RCTs in the 2000s were carried out to determine the impact of microcredit on increasing the income of the poor, the results were disappointing. Six RCTs were conducted on four continents by IPA and JPAL, which demonstrated that while microcredit did lead to increase in small business ownership and business activity, loans did not lead to increased income or profits, investments in children's schooling, or substantial gains in women's empowerment. Without increases in overall income, for the most part, the loans did not lift people out of poverty. More recently, there's been a lot of excitement and interest in the scaling up of cash transfers to the poor. Cash transfers are extremely efficient to distribute using mobile technology and provide the poor with the flexibility and the agency to decide how to allocate the funds. But can cash transfers sustainably lift ultra poor people? out of poverty? Do you have to continue to provide cash transfers in perpetuity? Village Enterprise used to provide cash transfers, but found that the very poor needed more than just cash to start and run successful businesses. The evidence on the effectiveness of cash transfers is mixed, and most of the evidence on cash transfers focuses on shorter term results. While most of the studies have shown short-term impact on household expenditure, only two-thirds of the nine studies that considered poverty reduction have seen positive impacts. And this caused the Overseas Development Institute, who conducted a rigorous and comprehensive review of the impact of cash transfers to conclude, while in many cases, cash transfers are successful in raising beneficiary household expenditures, these changes are not big enough to have substantial effects on poverty. Given the limited longer term evidence on cash transfers, we look at shorter term impacts on productivity as a proxy for what the longer term outcomes might be. And the evidence on productivity is quite varied, with a number of studies both showing and not showing impacts, suggesting in some cases short term positive results may hold, but in other cases, we would expect those short-term positive results to fade over time. Of note, there is one cash transfer study from Uganda that did recently follow up at the nine-year mark. While at the four-year mark, the evaluation found positive impacts on earnings, at the nine-year mark, the impacts could no longer be seen, as both the controls eventually increased both as the controls eventually increased their incomes on their own, and so both groups converged in employment, earnings, and consumption. Overall, the evidence shows that cash transfers can be impactful sometimes. However, in many contexts, ultra-poor households face many barriers beyond just capital constraints. As I mentioned, for many years, Village Enterprise implemented a cash transfer program. In 2010 and 11, we conducted research that demonstrated to us that more than cash and light mentoring was necessary to lift people out of extreme poverty. 
We looked at work that was being done by BRAC with their graduation model, CARE with their savings groups, and others to take a more comprehensive approach to poverty alleviation. However, we wanted to stay true to our cash transfer roots and ensure that whatever we implemented gave our first time entrepreneurs the opportunity to make their own decisions about what businesses to start, who to work with, and how much money to save. Community-based and locally led, our poverty graduation program equips Africans living in extreme poverty with a cash transfer to start a group-based business along with training and year-long mentoring by a local business mentor in order to start and successfully run income generating businesses and savings groups. Digital technology and a group-based approach makes this more scalable and cost-effective. Over 80% of our entrepreneurs are female and are empowered through our program to ensure greater gender equity and increased opportunities for women and families. We've also worked for the past 10 years with conservation partners like Wildlife Conservation Society, Africa Wildlife Foundation, and others to develop training and climate smart approaches to ensure that conservation and climate goals are also achieved. The advantage of poverty graduation programs like BRAC's and Village Enterprises is that they address multiple poverty traps, not just one. With the cash transfer, we address the lack of money. With the new business, lack of economic opportunities. With the training, the lack of skills and knowledge. With the mentoring, the lack of confidence, know-how and empowerment. With the savings groups and access to financial institutions, we address that there's no place to save money and that there is a lack of a savings habit and social capital. And more recently with digital tools, the lack of access and knowledge of how to use those tools. One of the most important things we've done as an organization is to invest in research. When we wrote our strategic plan back in 2010, we included the priority to do an independent randomized control trial to develop the evidence for our new model. RCTs are now considered the gold standard for evaluation of programs but this was quite a novel approach for a nonprofit with a small budget. While similar to the BRAC model that was evaluated in six countries under the CGAP Ford Foundation research, Village Enterprises model had some important differences. A cash transfer rather than an asset transfer. The cash transfer given to a group of three individuals who self-select to run a group business rather than to a household and training and mentoring at the group level rather than the household level, and a one-year duration rather than a two to three-year duration. These differences made our model significantly less expensive than other graduation programs evaluated. And when looking at the return on the dollar invested, the lower cost programs in India and Ethiopia and Village Enterprises program in Uganda generated the highest returns in overall consumption and assets per dollar invested. The exciting news is that six of the seven RCTs of the poverty graduation approach, including village enterprises, generated very positive results across multiple poverty, poverty indicators and important subjective well-being indicators like mental health, women's empowerment, agency, and standing in the community. As you can see here, the evidence demonstrated increases for income, consumption, savings, assets, food security, and nutrition. And as this evidence emerged, funders, policymakers, and governments began to recognize and prioritize this type of approach. One of the challenges with allocating funding is the lack of comparison of various approaches. Since we believe the agency of the end users of aid is critical, there is argument in the sector that if the cost effectiveness of providing cash transfers is the same or better than the cost effectiveness of providing a program, that it's better to provide cash. However, it can be difficult to compare results across independent studies because of variances in socioeconomic, geographic, and program design contexts across studies. 
which is why we believe it's important for studies to integrate cash benchmarking. This is something we prioritize when designing our first randomized control trial. We did this by giving randomly selected eligible households cash transfers equivalent to pre-calculated estimates of the entire cost to deliver our program. The results of the RCT found positive and statistically significant impacts of the Village Enterprise Graduation Program on all of our primary economic outcomes included in the study, but mostly did not see statistically significant impacts on these same outcomes of interest for those that received the cash transfers alone, except with, with respect to the asset value. These results validated our theory of change, which posits that ultra poor households we serve face multiple barriers to leaving extreme poverty and so cash or asset transfers must be complemented with other contextually relevant interventions, such as training, mentoring, coaching, savings groups, and so forth, to help them productively invest the capital and launch their journeys out of poverty. In order to make multifaceted economic inclusion programs like graduation more cost effective and scalable, there's still much work to do. And Village Enterprise has three major innovation efforts underway to do just that. The first is implementing the first development impact bond in poverty alleviation with funding from USA Development Innovation Ventures, UK Aid, a private foundation and private investors. In an, impact, in an impact bond, investors provide the upfront working capital to the service provider, in our case, Village Enterprise, and the outcome funders, in this case, USAID and UK Aid, only pay if results are positive. Our results are be, being evaluated as I speak by ID Insight. We be, believe that results-based funding mechanisms will provide greater focus on results and innovation as well as the improvement of systems. Village Enterprises developed a Salesforce-based adaptive management system that allows us to monitor the performance of the businesses and savings groups we start, as well as the performance of our field staff. These types of systems are more likely to be implemented under a results-based contract than a traditional grant. The second is our work with digital technology. We're working to make our program more scalable by using digital technology to implement all aspects of our program from the cash transfer to the training and the mentoring. This doesn't eliminate the in person business mentor, but augments what they can do and how efficiently they can provide services to our entrepreneurs. In addition, we're also experimenting with providing our entrepreneurs with a digital tool set, which will be a major area of innovation in the coming years. Finally, Village Enterprise was recently one of the winners of the Larson Land Iconic Award for Innovation and Scale-Ready Solutions for Refugees. Dreams for Refugees will layer for the first time two evidence-based models, Village Enterprise's graduation model with Mercy Corps' market systems model. Graduation will provide the capital and skills to support refugees as they establish business and market systems development will help build market access pathways to ensure that those businesses can be successful. And through the first rigorous evaluation of this approach will generate the evidence needed to fundamentally change how self reliance is perceived and funded in the refugee space. Village Enterprise is not working alone. We're, we're, we're part of a much larger community of practice that is committed to innovation and evidence as a way to drive poverty alleviation. Along with organizations like BRAC, Mercy Corps, CARE, World Vision, Trickle Up, Fundacion Capital, BOMA, and many other NGOs, Village Enterprise is a member of the World Bank's Partnership for Economic Inclusion. In order to end poverty, we're now working in partnership with governments around the world to incorporate this multifaceted type of financial inclusion into government social protection systems that already include cash transfers. However, there are still questions around the potential to deliver long term impact at scale when these programs are led by governments. 
and Village Enterprises working with the Kenya government on a World Bank project called KSEP to answer some of these unanswered questions and provide technical assistance to the Kenya government as they incorporate this program into their social protection. It's exciting to see that economic inclusion programs are already increasingly government-led and operating at scale. As you can see here, there are already 219 economic inclusion programs reaching over 92 million participants across 70 countries around the world. It's because of the amazing progress that, that has been made in just the past 11 years that I've been working in the poverty alleviation sector that convinces me that we can indeed eliminate extreme poverty in our lifetimes. I hope that you too feel encouraged by the evidence and examples that I've presented today. I know that people like Vicki and Salome feel hopeful because I had a chance to hear their stories. With the help of Village Enterprises program, Vicki started a retail business with two of her friends and was able to provide for her child and family. Salome formed a business group with two other women that decided to start a butchery business because in the refugee camp there was no meat available. With the help from their business mentor, they wrote a business plan and with the cash transfer, they bought the knives and the first goats that they slaughtered. And they were running a successful butchery business when I met Salome. When I talked to her about what was so empowering about this, she told me that someday she hopes to go home to South Sudan and she knows that she won't be able to bring the butchery business with her, but she said that no one can take away what she has learned and the skills that she's developed. And she knows that she can always start another business because of what she's learned. She knows that she can, prov she can provide for her children and that gives her hope for the future. Thank you very much. And um, I'd love to answer any of your questions. And I'm gonna stop my sharing of the screen. Let's see here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Diane, uh, for sharing that important work and, and evidence that drives the work that you do at Village Enterprise. Um, I'm gonna pass it over because I know that we have a lot of questions and not a lot of time. Um, so I will pass it over to uh, Sarah, our student ambassador, to uh, carry on the conversation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That was an incredible talk. And we have some awesome questions in the chat. The first one is from Nana, who asks, what are some of the sustainable measures incorporated in your poverty graduation program to ensure that participants are not pushed back into extreme poverty due to circumstances beyond their control, such as the pandemic? Yeah, so I think that the like what I tried to emphasize is that the ongoing coaching um, and training that our entrepreneurs receive is critical in order to ensure that they don't fall back into poverty. Um, so in addition to receiving the cash transfer that allows them to start the business, um, they receive ongoing coaching um, from a Village Enterprise business mentor. And that provides them with confidence, advice. And during the pandemic, there were some really great examples of how Village Enterprise was able to support our entrepreneurs um, during the pandemic um, using mobile technology. And many of our business owners were able to pivot. If you remember that first picture in my slide presentation, it was a tailoring business. And if you saw on the right, there was a mask. And what was really exciting to see is during the pandemic, some of our tailoring business were able to pivot to, um, to making masks um, and therefore were able to continue generating uh, income. Um, in the case of restaurants, um, it was kind of cool. Some of them started to produce um, uh, antiseptic um, uh, lotions so that um, people could get um, access to cleaning products during um, during the pandemic. Um, so I think that ongoing training and mentoring is really critical. Absolutely. I see that the screening room has a question. So I'm going to ask if they could unmute and share their question. We might have uh, lost them. Oh, 
Hello. Hi, Diane. Great to see you this morning. Um, my name is Sam Gann. I worked as a consultant to Village Enterprise between 2013 and 2014 in Hoima and Soroti, where I helped design and pilot the behavioral intervention. Um, I think the evidence is really clear that poverty is so complex that only comprehensive solutions like the graduation approach that Village Enterprise uses are an adequate remedy. But the obvious complication is that the graduation approach takes a long time to implement and is very logistically and operationally complex. Besides access to financing, I'm curious, what are the biggest obstacles that Village Enterprise faces in scaling up its program to more countries in Africa? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. And it's true that to operate a graduation program at scale requires um, pretty sophisticated systems. Um, and really talented staff. Um, so it, it is it is challenging, I, but I don't believe it's an obstacle that we can't overcome um, because um, Village Enterprise, since Sam was working at Village Enterprise, um, and when we, I, I think we were starting about 2000 businesses a year and this year we'll start close to 12,000 businesses. Um, and we're working with governments um, to help governments scale this. Um, so I think, you know, when I think about the biggest obstacles, I mean, the biggest obstacles are around, um, you know, training of staff and getting staff to the point that they really are capable of delivering this model well. Um, it's putting in place what I mentioned earlier, the adaptive management systems that allow you to really monitor and track the progress of the program. Um, and, you know, as, as you go to scale, um, you you need to make sure that um, the impact is sustained at the same level. And so what we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, is looking at innovations with digital technology um, that we feel will give entrepreneurs like better information, um, ongoing training and mentoring even after the program stops um, using uh, digital technology. Um, and, and digital technology, as I mentioned, also can make the program less costly um, and, and not require always an in-person uh, business mentor for all of the, the mentoring and training. So there, those are just some of the, I think, some of the things that would address the, your question. Thank you. We have more questions in the chat. There is one from Ernan um, who's asking, based on the 80% of women participating in the RCT program, what is their educational level? And were they encouraged to continue their education for themselves and their families? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so most of the women that we work with have very, very low levels of education. Um, very, very few of them have even finished primary school. Um, and most of them are functionally illiterate. Um, we don't work with women that are school aged. We mostly work with women that um, are no longer school aged. Um, so um, we do have a youth oriented program. Um, and in some cases, um, those women do go back to school as a result of the Village Enterprise program, but we're primarily working uh, with women that are um, 18 years old or older. Um, and um, so in the case of the Village Enterprise program, um, the training that they receive and the mentoring they received and learning how to use uh, digital tools, all of those um, types of skills and knowledge that they receive are, are really, really valuable given that they don't um, have um, the kind of education that all of us benefit from. Thank you. And on, on um, related to some points that you raised towards the end of your presentation, um, Henrietta is actually asking in the chat about specific, what specific methods you're using to scale some of these localized solutions to federal or global initiatives. Um, she said that you mentioned recent partnerships with the Kenyan government, but how do you scale these localized approaches when the technical solutions may not apply due to differing political or administrative contexts? Um, so one of the things that I think is really encouraging about the graduation model is that the RCT evidence um, is 
is very positive in many, many different um, contexts. So if you saw um, the study um, results that I presented, um, those results came from multiple countries, um, South American countries, African countries, um, India, um, Bangladesh is another country, um, and, and the graduation model has been um, tested in, in both rural and urban settings <clears throat> and is found to have positive results in all of those types of settings. Um, and that's why I think governments are so interested in potentially implementing graduation as part of their social protection. Um, so I, in terms of you know how Village Enterprise is working with governments, um, Village Enterprise is working alongside the Kenya government um, initially, we're, we're, we're both implementing the program, um, but also providing technical assistance to the Kenya government as they look to potentially incorporate it as part of their social protection. Thank you. Um, and actually, related to um, the story that you shared about Salome and especially about um, the butchery business that she was able to open and how much she was able to take away um, knowledge just being power in her case. Um, what kinds of new businesses, other businesses were initiated by um, ultra poor groups in Africa who received cash transfers and training? This is Jin, by the way, who's asking this. Um, because we work mostly in rural settings, <clears throat> the businesses are oftentimes agricultural businesses. Um, so in some cases, it's subsistence farmers um, moving from subsistence farming to income generating crops. Um, in some cases, it's um, starting livestock businesses, um, so rearing goats, pigs, chickens. Um, there are skilled labor businesses like um, tailoring and carpentry, um, uh, retail businesses, service businesses like small restaurants, uh, hair salons, um, so they really vary. Um, what we try to do when we go into a new area, um, our goal is to work with everyone that qualifies for our program. So every household that is ultra poor in a village um, is asked to participate in our program. Um, and therefore it's really important that we do a market systems assessment before we go into a village because we don't want too many businesses to be started in like one specific area, for example, you know, you know, if there are already a lot of kiosks selling uh, vegetables, we might not want to start lots of uh, retail businesses selling vegetables. Um, so we don't want to, you know, uh, saturate the market with too many of the same business. And so there's some needs assessment that goes on. Um, uh, but we do allow our business owners to choose what businesses they're going to start, uh, but they do that with advice from their business mentor and from this needs assessment that we do. Thank you. Actually, on that note, I do have a question of my own um, sure. that I would love to ask. Yeah. Um, so as you are considering um, sectors and industries in these villages that are um, still being developed and, and thinking of them as places where um, enterprises can grow. Um, how does this affect the local economy of the village? Um, are there targeted approaches um, that village enterprise has taken uh, to grow the local economy specifically in certain sectors? Or um, do you largely leave that up to the uh, villagers to decide where they want to go? Yeah, so we have in the past done some what's called value chain work where we'll we'll try to actually promote um, a whole sector um, and um, we've done that with um, Irish potatoes, um, sunflower oil, growing of sunflower seeds for sunflower oil. Um, the challenge with the approach is that it makes it difficult for Village Enterprise to allow the business owners to choose their own business, which we feel is a really important part of our program. Um, so now, rather than actually trying to develop a complete value chain, um, we do identify the value chains that are currently in, an, in a, a local area 
and um, in some cases will help our business owners um, get to a point where their business can successfully tap into that value chain. Um, and that way, um, if Village Enterprise goes away, they, they're, they're still going to be successful running that business. Um, I think when we were doing um, our value chain work, um, what we found is if, if Village Enterprise is doing too much of a heavy lift, um, when we leave, everything falls apart. And so what we really want is the business owners to be driving their own decision making. Um, but we are also giving them the tools to be successful to run those businesses um, in the long run. And that, that's really what's important. What we're really trying to create is long term, sustainable income generating businesses. Thank you. I believe we have time for one more question. Um, and on that note, actually, uh, Ko is asking, how do you then incentivize the mentors to devote their time to help the startups? And what has been the success rate of these startups to date and um, the learnings? Yeah. Um, so uh, how do we incentivize our business mentors? I mean, our business mentors are employed staff. Um, so they receive a salary. Um, we're We've decided not to um, pay based on performance of the businesses. Um, and that's because we feel that there are so many things that determine how successful a business owner is going to be. Um, and some business mentors are working in harder areas. They may be more remote. Um, they may have more challenging circumstances. Um, a drought might occur. There are all sorts of things that can happen that influence um, the success of businesses. Um, but one of the things that we do try to do at Village Enterprise um, is really um, build a culture that values um, the work of the business mentor. And we really look to our business mentors to drive our innovation process and our design challenges. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, excitement at the business mentor level in you know really making an impact in the lives of our entrepreneurs i think the other important thing is our business mentors are actually part of the communities in which they work so they're helping people that are part of their community and and there's a lot of you know a lot they they invest because they really want to see these people be successful because they're their community members. Um, and so I think that locally based approach is what really works. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Sarah, for definitely uh, coordinating this conversation and for asking everyone's questions and Diane for all of your thoughtful responses. I look forward and I know I, I speak for others on, on the call as well to following what the future of Village Enterprise is and, and how you continue to, to do the important work that you're doing. Well, thank um, you, Sarah. And you're so welcome. Uh, and for everyone else on the call, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, and we again hope that you will join us for our next speaker series on Friday, October 15th. Again, that will be at 12.15 p.m. Eastern time with Andrew Stern, who's the founder and CEO of the Global Development Incubator. Um, and that conversation will be moderated by Harvard Business School senior lecturer, Brian Trellstad. And he'll be talking on creating impact at a global scale for development. Um, and if you enjoyed today's conversation and want to hear more from Diane, we'll be actually recording a podcast after this call, uh, and that will be available on CID's SoundCloud channel early next week. So please check back for that. Um, if you want to share the recording, uh, it will also be on YouTube later this afternoon. So thank you all very much and have a wonderful rest of your day.